Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast, and with us is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Josh. Hi, Christian. How are you? Good, good, good. Good to be here. There's no orange behind you. Doesn't that look like your home? Nope, not home. <laughs> so where are you? I am in the lovely, and I mean it, lovely town of Dubuque, Iowa. <laughs> it's funny you had to tell us that you actually meant it when you said that, because otherwise we would assume you were being sarcastic. Yeah, because, I mean, when you hear Dubuque, Iowa, I think you have cornfields in your mind or something else. But this is an adorable little river town right on the Mississippi River. And it's right next to Galena, Illinois, which is another adorable little town. Uh, it's got deep history, amazing people, good food, cute little shops, wonderful wall art everywhere. Uh, so thriving film community. So it's a great little town. That's great. And Jason Rugg is with us, not in Dubuque, Iowa. Hey there. How's it going, Jason? Good. Good. It's, good. You know, a rainy, stormy day. It's I'm ready for summer to get here. <laughs> That's what tomorrow. I am. I'm just... <laughs> it's tomorrow. It's coming tomorrow. It's gonna be like 80 degrees and sunny. Is yeah, it really? Hustles. Oh, I'm so glad because it's rainy and yucky here in Dubuque, Iowa, too. Guys, it's been awful it, for like three weeks. I hate April it. <laughs> showers bring May flowers. Come on, That's May. How... Come on, right. May. It's next week. So or two weeks. No, it's in a it's in like nine, ten days. So Okay, we have a lot to cover today, so let's jump right in um, before we talk about our limited series on distribution. Um, Christian, you are at a film festival in Dubuque. Uh, you are sharing grueling glory. How is that going? Yeah, I've been I've been really happy. So um, first of all, I was thrilled that Grueling Glory got in here. It is one of the favorite film festivals that we were in. We were here last year with the Girl Who Wore Freedom, and we did win the Best Documentary uh, Award. And it's just, you know, the people are so great. I met amazing filmmakers and saw tremendous films. And so I really wanted to come back and they brought me back to do panel discussions as well. One of the things that's so cool about this festival is that when you um, are nominated or if you come to do a fest, uh, like a panel or if you do a coffee talk, they provide your transportation and your lodging. And so, and then they feed you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, I mean, it's just, who, who does not want to come here? Uh, the, um, the things that they have done to bring the supporters of the town uh, to the film festival, you know, Run Day Auto Group, they provide all the transportation, but for the filmmakers and audience from the main like uh, hotel where everything is run out of to all the different venues. And they have people that are catering all the food. It just is endless, the community support. And so uh, just all the benefits of being here and the people that you meet, it's just like a big, huge family and they are passionate about good film and they screen the films really well. So you see a lot of quality stuff when you're here um and get your brain educated so yesterday i saw a really cool uh film called leftover feelings uh, that was just awesome and some other ones i'm going to talk about in my documentary deja docuview deja vu segment see you can't say it correctly either. i know i know we got to get a new title um <laughs> uh, well how is grueling glory being received and how does it compare to your experience with the grill war freedom one of the things that was a little frustrating is that I was put into a short block, which is fine because what happens is they put these four different shorts together and then it comprises like an hour and a half, like a feature um, window. Uh, but they are only showing it on Wednesday and Thursday. And of course, you know, Friday, Saturday are the two big days in any film festival. Uh, so I was a little frustrated that we weren't getting a Friday, Saturday slot. Uh, but I was thrilled with the short block group I was placed in. So I was placed with three other films, which are superb. One of them being a short block nominee. We were not nominated at all in this film festival. And I understand why, because our film is good. It's beautiful and it has a sweet message. Um, but there are not a lot of action steps at the end. And it's really more of a thoughtful piece about what, you know, 
Michelle Phoenix witnessed and what it did to her emotionally. Um, the other films that we that are here, there is some sort of um, call to action at the end of them, and they are very emotional and they deal with um, difficult topics like Im immigration or poverty um, or you know racial injustice, things like that. And um, I recognize that the audience really responds to those. So while we, um, while I was in this block, the Q and A, the people clapped and they uh, really enjoyed our film, and they did have a few questions at the end. But the m major questions were for the other films in the block, and that was a little strange for me because I am used to being, uh, you know, nominated and uh, in a feature. So I'm just in the block by myself, and um, I actually like it. I like it uh, for it's different for many different reasons, but um, I've enjoyed talking to these films in my block and kind of amplifying them. So in the very first um, screening we were in, the question asker really didn't know what questions to ask. And the audience wanted to ask questions. I could tell that, but didn't know what to say. And so I was like, well, you know, I'm a great question asker. I have a lot of questions for your films. And so I did, did the Q&A with the other films that I really loved and the filmmakers were grateful for that and the people you know loved the conversation afterwards so um i've been enjoying that and um, it's just a definitely different experience for sure but that's not fun um yeah I, I i were there more people this year than last year definitely more people last year there were very few filmmakers there was just like i don't know a handful of us and we all got very close very quickly. Now there's a lot of filmmakers from all over. Like so, there's somebody I met from Cambodia that's here and um, you know, people from LA and New York and um, Illinois. They're just kind of from all over Atlanta. A lot of people here from Atlanta. There's a lot of film stuff going on in Atlanta. Uh, so um, yeah, way more filmmakers here and there was more audience members here. So in the second screening that we had yesterday, there, it was sold out plus a bunch of people standing outside wanting to get in. And that was not the case last year. So people are definitely braving things um, and kind of leaving COVID behind them, it seems. Fun, fun, awesome. All right, well, what's happening on documentary first team side? What's going on with the Girl Who Wore Freedom? Well, it has been a busy and wonderful week. Uh, one of the first things I wanna do is welcome Chad Gilchrist and Taylor Banowski to our team. I am thrilled about this power couple in Chicago. Uh, they started listening to the podcast uh, because um, a friend in Chicago who uh, was listening to our podcast uh, recommended they listen to the podcast. So they started listening. They reached out to me because they're Christians and they thought it was awesome that there was a Christian documentary filmmaker living in the Chicago area and they wanted to make a documentary. Um, I said, I'd love to meet them. And then it took a year before I was able to do that. Really. Um, I, my memory was jogged when Chad, uh, decided to support the documentary first Patreon. And I was so touched by that, so grateful. I met with him right away uh, and so impressed, impressed with his resume, impressed with how he runs his business. And um, he's getting married to Taylor at the end of June and she is a producer. And so both of them have worked in the Chicago area for a, quite a long time on commercial work and some bigger film projects. He, his day job is as a g and &E, Grip and Electric, and he's done all a lot of roles in there um but they and she produces commercials but they want to do you know passion projects and when i talked to one of our cinematographers who i didn't think was gonna make it to carenton he um i reached out to both of them she speaks french and they are excited to be part of this project so they're going to join us in normandy and help us with the unlocking the road to liberty carenton project so uh super happy about that uh, the news just keeps getting better, though, because as of yesterday, uh, people can now buy a DVD on our website. Uh, no password required, no nothing. You just go there and the DVD is on sale for $24.99. And then thanks to my team, Ben Fythen and David Needham, you can now stream The Girl Who Wore Freedom from our website for 
$5.99. It's an amazing deal. Um, and this happens so quickly and I'm just thrilled about that. So uh, if you have friends that haven't seen the film, definitely let them know they can now stream it or buy a DVD. All they have to do is go to thegirlywarfreedom.com. Uh, and I do want to give a shout out to, to Ben Fife. And I mean, he has really pulled his weight over the last couple of weeks. He was the one that found contact information so that we could get our film off of all these other platforms and begin streaming it uh, on our website. And then David Needham discovered Gumroad. Gumroad is a portal. It's been there for about 10 years that allows you to put your products there and you can sell through them. In films, they have a whole bunch of things built in to be able to help you to do that safely so people won't you know, steal or pirate your stuff. And they do take a 9% commission, but it's well worth it in my opinion uh, for all the securities that they build in and just the ease of the way that you can just plug it into your website and go. And the other amazing thing is we're now going to be able to make our French version and our dual language version uh, available in Europe because they will handle the VAT, ta VAT taxes. And that's been a problem that we've had all along at trying to figure out how to get our um, product to people in Europe that wanted to what's watch. A, what's so, a VAT tax? A VAT tax is the tax that Europe um, assesses on anything that is sold in Europe. Um, or if the Europeans buy anything outside, it's basically like, a, like an import export tax and mm -hmm. it's complicated. Um, it's just a complicated economic situation to run if you're a small company like ours and it's expensive. Like we tried to sell our shirts and stuff over there. Like it, it just economically wouldn't make sense, um, for us to do that. So we've never been able to, but now this, we can even put other stuff in the Gumroad store, like our shirts, like our books. Um, so I'm excited to explore uh, what else we can can do through Gumroad. So that was a great discovery this week. Um, and again, the news just keeps getting better. Uh, we reached out to Virgil Films and asked if they would consider distributing The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Uh, they absolutely are interested. I asked them, would it be possible to do all of this before our big events start happening in May? Unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, they do have to send us a contract. We have to review it and go through all the legal stuff. And then we have to give all the deliverables to them and they have to make their deals with the distribution platforms. Um, and they're pitching their shows for the August, September releases. And so, um, so there's this in-between window where we don't have any distribution, but I know people are going to want to watch or buy the film. And that's why we put this into action. And I just give Joe um, Amade a ton of credit. I went to him and said, do you mind if during this time we distribute ourselves? And he said, oh, no, absolutely not. Go ahead and do that. So uh, just thrilled about those developments. That's well, a big deal. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. So oh, speaking one of, other thing. One oh, other thing. No. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, there's one other thing. <laughs> He's going to take the movie to the Cannes film market. Oh, so that's just awesome. You know, he's going to take it over there. I think he's going to screen it over there and look for international distribution for us. So, so what, what does that mean? Take it to the Cannes film market? Like what? Yeah. So a lot of times big film festivals will have, you know, they'll have the festival where films are there and you can go and watch them and distributors come and watch them uh, to figure out if they want to give them distribution. And then there is the market where distributors go and they display their wares. Um, they, they can have screenings and invite you know, people to come and watch the film. Uh, they have meetings with different kinds of distributors where they show the portfolios. Um, and you know, it usually either goes before or after a film festival or is alongside the festival. So the Cannes Film Festival is typically at the end of May in Cannes. And then the film market runs around the same time. Any more good news you want to talk about? Because <laughs> it's getting old now. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. There is one other thing. Uh, Airbus has now moved our screening. We have a few more details about that to the Air and Space Museum, uh, the Udvarhazy um, Museum in um, Dulles, right outside of Dulles in Western Virginia. And that is going to be happening on uh, May 12th. And so it sounds like it may be open to the public. So we'll keep everybody posted on those details. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned distribution a few minutes ago, and I was going to try and say, speaking of distribution and transition, but then you kept giving more good news and I don't have a good transition. So I'm just going to have to stop hard, 
make a right turn. It's time to talk about distribution because that's what this limited series is about, right? True, it is, it okay. is. So maybe uh, get a recap here. Um, you terminated your contract with your distribution company. You said, see you later. And uh, so now we're just doing a postmortem on, on all this, just kind of learning, which will be helpful as you move into new distribution potentially soon. So, um, but last week, you forgot to give the initial <laughs> of the distributor at the end of the podcast. Can you do that now, Christian? Yes, I did forget. Uh, and you, can you guys please remind me at the end of the podcast? Uh, <laughs> we, okay, so this, no, no promises. We can't <laughs> promise. We'll remember either. So uh, the second, uh, the second initial of this particular distributor is F. So to recap, the first initial is F. The second initial is F. At the end of this podcast, we'll give you the other one. So uh, there you go. Frankfurter distribution. Got it. All right. <laughs> Um, okay, so after the initial conversation, um, you know, with trying to make amends, and then you sent a letter saying you're in breach of contract, and then they couldn't, couldn't, what, what do you say that like, make good on their end? Um, so let, let's let, let in the beginning, when you got the contract originally, did you just sign it? What, what did you do? So originally we had conversations um, initially to kind of recap this, um, the um, there's one person in their company that is in charge of acquisitions. He saw us at the trailer film festival, saw our trailer, asked to watch the film. They watched the film. They said they wanted to distribute it. We talked to them about the film, how we wanted to be involved in marketing, all that other stuff. We, they seem like nice people. We seem to get along. So they said, we're going to send you sort of a mock agreement. And they sent us a mock agreement that we looked through. And in that, I mean, it's not a mock agreement. It's basically like their un, um, it's just their base agreement. And so we looked through it. It seemed weird. We changed a lot of the language. We told them we wanted to carve out theatrical rights and, you know, change several different things. And then, you know, you discuss about those things. Will they accept those changes? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, they did. They accepted all of our changes. I thought at the time that I made some great decisions that would kind of help us in the end. Um, I have learned I should have done some things differently. We can get to that later. But um, once we agreed on the terms, they then plugged in all of the pertinent information into a new contract and they sent it to us. We signed it, they signed it. And then it was a fully executed contract. And once that contract was signed, um, then we had to start delivering our materials and we were off to the races. So I wanted to talk about what this contract looked like. Now, again, I have only had experience with one distributor this is just my experience. This is my contract. It doesn't mean it's the same for every single person. So I just want to give that caveat. This is just my experience. So in this contract, the first two and a half pages are uh, the, the distribution agreement and the deal terms. And it's just two and a half pages. It lists out um, the term, basically how long it's for, the territory, the rights, what kind of rights. So like, what is the effective date of the contract? What are all the different rights that this distributor is allowed to do? Basically where they can place the film. Uh, and then it talks about their distribution fees, how much they're going to charge you to be your distributor. Um, and then it talks about how they're, what they're gonna do with the gross receipts and the net proceeds. And then it's going to, they're telling you what their expenses are. And so that's the basic deal and the agreement. You sign it and that's it. Now, the other thing that you have to know what they deliver with this two and a half page document is a very, very long document of, you know, many pages. I'm, I'm scrolling down here. It's like more than 20, like 25 pages um, of just other stuff. So what is that other stuff? So schedule, there's a schedule A and the schedule A is all of the definitions of all of the standard terms. And that's everything from what the definitions of, you know, control are, what is AVOD, what is, you know, 
SVOD. Um, what does delivery look like? What does distribution expenses mean? Um, you know, what is what are marketing expenses? What does gross receipts mean? Um, you know, and then and then it gets down to the really you know important stuff, which is um, you know I'm looking here the internet rights, the licensors' represent, uh, representations and warranties, um, you know, all this stuff with musical rights, and then um, indemnity, how we, you know, what we can't do in terms of, um, you know, if they do something wrong or uh, how we can't sue them, basically. Um, and then it covers accounting records, accounting reports, um, they, how they, the force majeure clause, which basically if there's an act of God, they're not held responsible to stuff in the contract, um, you know, termination terms, um, you know, and severability and dispute resolution. I mean, it's just, it goes on and on and on. And you have to make sure that you read all of those terms because terms are everything. They can, you can look at that agreement and say, oh my goodness, we have an agreement. This is so excited. Oh yes, this all sounds good to me. But if you, the devil is in the details. And if you don't read those definitions, um, yeah, it could be bad for you. This seems like, uh, this is why you would need a lawyer. I mean, I don't care if you're making a film or just hiring a distributor for your food processing company or whatever. Not everyone can understand legalese and expect be expected to understand definitions and and it, it would seem like th this is the reason to have I mean like you have a realtor at your closing you know when you buy a house because you have a lawyer at your closing or yeah. what yeah. did I say realtor oh you do have a realtor at your closing <laughs> I wasn't wrong um, but you should also have an attorney there <laughs> it's because you can't understand everything right. And, and so I don't, I mean, I'm surprised, well, I mean, you're married to an attorney, but I mean, you, you seem to know more than I would expect the average person when it comes to reading contracts and so on. Only because I've gone through this whole process now. So you absolutely have to have a lawyer, but you have to have a lawyer from the very beginning um, to help with write out your deal memos with your crew uh, to help check and make sure that, you know, you have the um, rights to your title. And I mean, lawyers are integral to everything that you do as a filmmaker and, you know, they are expensive. I mean, that's why you have to put uh, legal um, fees and accounting fees into your budget for the film uh, because you really are in trouble if you don't have them. Um, it is way, way over my head. I did have to, it's why I brought David Patterson in the loop, why uh, Hunter was in the loop, Bill Ben Fython has been, all of those people have business experience. So they understand the way the business works and they've had these things before. So they understand a bit of the legalese. And then we've had John Scanlon who has had to advise us on every single thing and explain what each one means. And even though we went over it and over it in the beginning, we all had to repeatedly come back to this contract um, as we began to inter encounter difficulties with the distributor. Um, and only then did I realize how I should have changed things more uh, in the beginning when we were, you know, making this deal. So, okay. So you, you finally settle on the terms. They agree to your changes. You're you're in. I think we talked about some of the red flags, poor communication, lack of communication, lack of paying you money. <laughs> These are problems, right? Um, yeah. What I guess really what I'm interested in knowing is you're entering in potentially to another distribution deal. It sounds like you've got someone working with you. Uh, it sounds like it's a reputable company. But still, like you, you want to be careful. So how are you approaching this one differently? Well, um, first of all, um, I have a relationship with this distributor, which is very different. 
I've now been working with him for a year uh, on these other projects, talking with him. So I not only have I talked to other people about him and learned his reputation in the industry, um, but now I have my own relationship with him after this year. And I have just, you know, I found him to be honest, communicative, uh, kind, uh, just hardworking, uh, and, you know, super truthful. Uh, sometimes he doesn't tell me the things I want to hear, but he tells the truth. And so I've learned to respect that person and his business, the way he runs it. So that's different. Um, and that's, I'm very fortunate that way. Uh, I think only by networking, like film festivals have been so huge for me in terms of the networking piece of it. And, you know, here at Dubuque, Iowa last year, that's when I met Donna Reed's daughter, Mary Owen, who had been working with Joe Amade for 25 years, who could vouch for him and his character. And, you know, now here I am again, a year later, and, you know, there's been a, a lot of wonderful water under the bridge. So that would have never happened if I hadn't been here at a, at a film festival. So that kind of networking, I think really does help introduce you to distributors face-to-face, -face, hopefully. Um, and then they will send us a contract and we will have to do the same thing all over again. We will have to review it with our business people. We will have to have our lawyer, um, you know, look at it and figure out, come to terms with what the deals are that we both feel good about. Um, one of the things that I, you know, we're going to have to talk about are the DVD rights. I did not carve them out of that first contract. And that was a big mistake because all of our audience is older. They do still watch DVDs and they've wanted to buy them. And the other distributor would not give us the ability to sell those on our website. Um, so that was a problem. I did keep theatrical rights, which I will continue to do this time because we do screen the film a lot in different places. Um, and I probably will do a shorter um, term, like the last agreement was five years, and that was a really long time um, in case something goes wrong. And uh, so, so and, and we'll have to look at the other things um, that their contract says, their contract will be different. So I'm certainly going to scrutinize it a lot more. So uh, one of the things you had in your last contract was they had to give quarterly reports and pay you once a quarter. Yes. Is that standard? Is that going to be similar to this new contract? Yes. Can you make it different? The one difference, um, I actually talked to Joe about this because um, in this last contract, it said that they were to give quarterly reports and payments at the end of each quarter, but there was a 90 day grace period. And so basically they didn't need to give you those things until the you know beginning of the next quarter. Um, but when I talked to Joe about that, their terms, he says is 60 days. And he said, 60 days is more the industry standard than 90 days. So if I was looking at a contract, any contract, I would make sure to catch that, um, for sure. Cause really, as far as you're concerned, it's not 90 days, it's 180 days, or it's not 60 days, it's 120 days. Yeah. And the other thing I didn't do, quite frankly, and I hope other filmmakers will do this, I didn't understand really when I needed to start paying attention to that closely. I anticipated that they would do what they were supposed to do. And so I was off living my life, not really paying attention until I was like, you know, when am I supposed to be getting money? <laughs> and then I went back. And that was in November. Well, the first quarter ended August, uh, sorry, let me, I think it was July 1st. So um, May, June, January, February, March. So April, May, June. So at the end of June, 1st of July, I should have gotten my first report and check. And I did not clue into that until November. So if I would have clued into that a lot earlier around August and said, hey, when are we getting our report and our payment? Um, that would have been a lot better, I think, for us. So kind of wrapping up, I mean, just, you know, things I'm taking away from this, if I was going to make a film and get a distribution deal, um, everyone, like you said, pay attention to not only what the agreement says, understanding the terms, but are they 
making do on their end? Are they following through with their responsibilities? Because I, I do the same thing when we hire like a contractor to work on our house or something. I, I'm just naive enough to think, well, they're going to do what they say they're going to do. <laughs> 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 I don't know how many times I've learned this lesson that I'm still like, no, 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 this guy, he's, he's, you know, I don't need to write anything down. You know, I'll remember and he'll just do what he says he's going to do. Right. You know, so uh, pay attention to those terms. Um, uh, changes like shorten your agreements, you know, the time frames, when you get reports, when you get paid, how long are you in, a, you know, in business together, things like that. Uh, get a lawyer. because <laughs> I, I don't know about anyone else. I mean, I, I, especially people who, who are artists just aren't that interested in learning a whole new language, you know, yeah. like business and legalese <laughs> and like as important as these things are, it's like, you really do I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's like, I don't want to become a doctor, right? You know, I mean, I can do things, take care of myself, but I don't need to, to go to med school. I need to find a good doctor. I don't need to go to law school. I need to find a good lawyer, right? And uh, unfortunately, these things cost money, but we need them. Jason, were you going to say something? Yeah, actually, that that made me think of um, just recently, I signed on to do a freelance uh, animation project with a company um, using um, along with my partner, Sean, who uh, Josh and Christian both know. Um, Sean's actually we're he's producing it, we're, we're animating it. And it was to do with so, it was it was just a little freelance thing. It's not, not a huge deal. But uh, one of the things was in the contract, we're working with someone else's intellectual property that this publisher has the rights to but we don't individually have the rights to and so sean was looking through it and he's just like uh there's no protection here for us to you know actually work with this if if the the person who owns the ip comes back and says we we don't like what you did with it we could be held liable not the not the um the people who are paying us to make it and so we had to like ask for certain protections to be put in and everything and so sean actually um, it was really interesting to me because it's like I would have never even considered anything to do with that. And Sean was able to just like, no, 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 this <laughs> we need to change that. We need to adjust this. And yeah, it was it was really interesting to see. Um, because I would have just I looked over the contract, I was like, Yeah, this seems fine, seems great. <laughs> and it's like, you know, maybe nothing will happen with that. And you know, hopefully nothing would, but you want to make sure that you're protected and to actually have someone who knows a little bit more of what they're doing to look over it and actually knows what should be in a contract. Uh, definitely a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, being here at the film festival, I've talked to several filmmakers um, and when they hear me talking about the business end of things, they're like, Oh yeah, you, you sound a lot more business savvy than me. I, I don't know anything about all these things. And I, I mean, really everybody is so focused on making their thing and taking it to film festivals. And when I ask them, well, what's your plan, you know, after this? Well, I don't know. I haven't really thought about that. And I just, it makes me so sad. I'm like, oh my goodness, you really should have thought about that before you started. Uh, you know, I talked to someone. Yeah. It's just, um, I just have found you have to consider the end business part of it. It is not fun. It is not what we want to do. And you either need to find a Roy Disney who's going to handle all the business for you and you make your thing and walk away and let them do all the business, which would be ideal. Or, you know, more than likely than not, you as the independent filmmaker are going to have to, to do this business stuff and make decisions from very early on. Christian, before we um, switch gears to our other segment, um, is there anything else you want to say wrapping up our uh, limited series on distribution? Well, no, other than uh, we're going to give the, the third letter at the end of this podcast. Uh, next week, we'll tell you who they are. Uh, and that will be the end of this limited series. Uh, you know, as far as I know, we may pick it up back later when we get new distribution and talk about that. Um, so do you want to get the letter before we forget? Because yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what are the first two, Jason? FF. Yes. FF. The last one is S as in snake. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> hmm. Would we, I mean, we're not guessing right now, but do we even... <laughs> 
would if you said the name would it be like oh you're kidding not then i mean people know uh, i don't thing? know you know they're not a big distributor so they're especially not in the united states i mean i'll also tell you they're in canada so i mean if you've been listening to the podcast oh, you know that and you have heard say this no name. more <laughs> Canadian <laughs> distribution <Canucks>. companies. <laughs> uh, uh i do have go ahead jason uh, go ahead christian i was just going to ask um the thing that's been kind of building in my mind listening to all of this, you know, it's, it's become kind of a train wreck, right? This whole whole thing. And we had to do a, a three-part podcast about it, talking about everything that you learned and everything that could have been done differently. If you had no other distributor on the horizon, do you think that, like, honestly, do you think you would have been better off without a distributor at all? And just done, you know, like through relationships, gone to Delta and that sort of thing and negotiated it yourself have individual contracts with people do you think you would have been better off on your own or I will would tell you... you there is no better time than now to be to self-distribute no better time than now to self-distribute there are so many channels and opportunities um let's just look at gumroad that i just found out about yesterday uh and there are many more um but you know you can self-distribute you can self-sell through um you know outlets like that there's one difference, and that is if you self-distribute, all of the marketing is then on you. And marketing is a huge piece of it because if you have your you know, film up on your website, but you have no social media following, you have no, you're not buying any advertising on TV or anywhere else, um, how are people going to find your film other than word of mouth or whatever? So um, I just think that self-distributing, um, is a very viable option, like, and, and you can make a lot of money with it. So the chosen has come up with an unbelievable self-distribution model and there have made tremendous amounts of money and marketed their products in an incredible way. Um, and, and that took a huge business team behind them to do that. So it is absolutely a viable option and you certainly are better off if you control your property and if you can, if you have the dollars to market and you know how to run a business, because then not only are you a filmmaker, but now you are a distributor and, and that comes with its own realm of challenges. Um, it's a great question. And the other thing is right now, all the everything in our industry, it's like there's this tsunami happening or a giant earthquake underneath the entertainment industry and all the plates are shifting. And we don't really know what it's going to be like uh, next month, next year, you know, five years from now. So it does make that decision to self-distribute or go through a distributor a lot more challenging. You have to be, do your due diligence to find out what's best for you. Okay, well, you heard it here first. Self-distribute, everyone. <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you for uh, sharing that lessons learned, and uh, but exciting things on the horizon. We're going to shift gears right now to our still calling it new segment, DocuView Deja Vu. DocuView Deja Vu. Woo, you did it. Did I? I, I even questioned after I said it. Like, that right? <laughs> I think it had a little bit too much e in the view, e but yeah, it's, it's close enough. <laughs> e e v e v e v e <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I can't believe this has lasted as long as it has. But I know. <laughs> well, we have the theme song. We can't get rid of it. Um, True. True. Um, I'll go first. Um, I am going to bring, I don't think we've talked about this one. I get confused because, you know, Jason and I are on a podcast where we bring movies to the table and we always say, uh, have we talked about this before? Which means we probably have. <laughs> uh, I'm bringing the 1994 documentary Hoop Dreams. Do we talk oh, about Oh, yeah. I haven't I seen have. Hoop Dreams. Tell us a little what? bit about it. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm embarrassed to say. Um, so this was, uh, this actually film. well, first of all, this film is almost three hours long. Um, it is, uh, 
it's, it's actually a film. The film, I think the filmmakers are from this area. I'm going to start speculating stuff that I have no idea what I'm talking well, about. Well, I will so tell, I'm just you tell you this. What I know. No, I'll tell you this. Frederick Marx, who is become a friend of mine from a film festival, is one of the producers on Hoof Dreams. I've thought about having him come on the podcast. He now heads up Warrior Films, and so they've been doing a lot of military films as well. Uh, but yes, he and others are from the Chicago area. Okay. Uh, I, I thought it was great because it follows a group of boys uh, in, you know, grade school to high school who have dreams of making it in the NBA. So you get to see what their lives are like and the expectations of, you know, getting into the NBA, but the reality of how many people actually make a career in basketball. So it's it's a sobering but well-made documentary. The, the other thing I just want to say is, uh, I don't know if your friend was involved in this other project, but there was a I think it was on PBS. I'm not sure. It was a series on, they filmed it in the high school in Oak Park. So it's Oak Park High School. And it was about race relations and, and just following students around the school and, and just think what it means to be black in this high school and, and having teachers and dealing with race related topics of the day. A friend of mine is a teacher there. His buddy volunteered to be featured in the film, like have the camera crew come in and film him and his students. And, and this guy views himself as, you know, very pro student, really trying to be proactive and, and reach, you know, he's a white guy and he's trying to, you know, create positive relationships with, you know, people of different colors and, and, <laughs> Uh, I think a lot of teachers were wary about volunteering and were worried about him volunteering. And sure enough, here's a guy who has a reputation in school of being a guy who's trying to make a positive difference. But just the way the documentary came out, he was viewed as the bad guy. He was viewed as um, taking advantage of these kids, you know, speaking down to them. You know, just the way he was portrayed in the film was not positive. And so people who didn't know him thought he was, you know, just he was the bad guy of the series, which was really unfortunate because that was not who this guy is but it's just how it came out and uh it's just an interesting side of documentary filmmaking i think yeah you know after doing the girl who were freedom i realized the power of editing you really can almost make people say whatever you want them to say right and um and then the filmmaker's point of view is what the rest of the world sees um yeah that's unfortunate but hoop dreams worth seeing check it out <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, all right um, christian I, oh jason you got one yeah so mine isn't actually a, a documentary but it is a youtube channel um that does a lot of video essays and they kind of will go through and, they, and oftentimes they'll pull from documentaries about films and that sort of thing and so it's uh, every frame of painting um it's kind of one of the first big video essay youtube channels and uh, they're not around anymore. They stopped making videos about five years ago, but they really set the tone for what video essays and like mini documentaries on YouTube could be about films and filmmaking. And they're absolutely a must watch if you love film, if, you, if you've ever gone, huh, why, why doesn't uh, any a musical cue from Marvel come to mind when I think of, you know, any of the movies they have a whole video explaining why that happens and it's it's just fascinating they, they dig into you know the coen brothers and and various um you know anime and uh sherlock the bbc series and all sorts of stuff they do a ton of different video essays uh definitely worth your time if you love filmmaking so, so name again. Pardon what's my... it called every frame of painting every frame of painting yep pardon my ignorance but what is a video essay as opposed to just a video? So a video essay is where uh, one person kind of compiles a bunch of footage and then narrates over the top of it. So um, it's, it's kind of like if you were to write a paper in school about, uh, you know, one particular topic, like we're going to really talk about uh, Michael Bay's films. You know, if you're in film school and you're going to write a, 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 a paper about it, but instead of it being a paper, they're backing it up with footage and narration. So it's, there's music and it's really well produced and it'll be like an eight minute, you know, just really short documentary uh, about 
Michael Bay, they'll be looking over like every film Michael Bay has ever made. And what is Bayhem, which is a term that people use for Michael Bay. It's, it's mayhem in a Michael Bay film. And he breaks down how it works and why it works and sometimes why it doesn't work. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's effectively if you were to write a paper, an essay, but you do it as a video. Awesome. Learned something new today. Christian, what about you? So I'm going to talk about a film that was in my short block at this festival uh, because it is just stuck with me and I'm so blown away. Um, this film is called Robert's Village. And Robert's Village is a short film about a guy named Robert who is from Uganda. And he has this powerful story of being from New Uganda alive during Idi Amin's massacre of just so many civilians in Uganda, including a lot of members of his family. Um, he is a handicapped. And during that whole um, thing, he was captured. They talked about killing him. And in the end, they didn't kill him. So he was a boy at the time. He survived. And um, he survived because he was handicapped, I guess. And he then kind of grew up in his village. At some point, he met a woman who became his friend and she, he went to visit her in the United States. They fell in love. They got married. And then uh, she died of cancer, which was so sad. Um, but they had relocated in Chicago and he's a custodian at uh, CSU University or CSU which is, I guess, Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. And he's a custodian there. He began talking to a student there who heard about what was happening in his village and his heart's desire to bring education to the children in his village. And so they began a GoFundMe. And in, I don't know, just a very short amount of time, he was hoping for $500, um, $9,000 came in. And they began building a school in his little town um, village in Uganda. And so this film chronicles what happened as, you know, she began to help him with this GoFundMe page, people began supporting, and then they built not only one school, but three. And then they go to Uganda to see the effect that these schools have on this little village. It just was so powerful and emotional. And Robert is actually here at the film festival. And he is just this bright ray of sunshine, this beautiful human uh, who is so concerned about helping you know, others in his village. So he sends money back to take care of nephews and he uh, is continuing to raise money for these schools. And their situation is so tragic um, even to this day, these schools struggle to even have food to feed the children. So um, it's called Robert's Orphanage, and you can go to robertsorphanage.org. Brian Buss is the filmmaker. He's actually a videographer editor at CSU, and this is like his first, you know, big project. And, you know, you can support what they're doing. You can make a donation at that website. There is a trailer there. Um, and then I think they're going to put the short film up on their website at some point. So uh, it's just an incredible story. They are nominated for a, an award here at this festival. My guess is they're a shoe in to win. Uh, it's a powerful story. So yeah, Robert's Village, check it out. Awesome. All right. We got some viewing for the weekend. So thank you for everyone bringing a movie to the table. Um, so as a reminder, you can go and purchase a DVD of The Girl Who Wore Freedom. You can stream it. Uh, where can they go to see that? TheGirlWhoWoreFreedom.com for all your Girl Who Wore Freedom needs. You got tons of books and clothes, and now you've got a DVD and the ability to stream. So uh, definitely do that. And if you have not joined our Patreon page, uh, do that. We're going to start um, disseminating a list of all of our 
um, DocuView Deja Vu suggestions uh, to all of our Patreon subscribers. And, you know, we're going to have extra content up there as well. We really could use your support. Uh, we still are trying to find ways to keep our company going. So Patreon is the best way to do that. So we have some monthly support and keep listening to the podcast. We really do hope that we are making a difference in your filmmaking. We're teaching you some history uh, and, you know, hopefully we're uh, saving you from making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to uh, learn from other people's mistakes for sure. <laughs> Well, hey, everyone. Yes, uh, I also want to say thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. <laughs>